There are over 13,000 cards for duelists to create the perfect deck. Many of those cards made their very first appearance in the anime, but for some they would never cross the bridge to the physical card game. Have these cards been lost to time, or are they far too powerful to introduce to today's metagame? The time has come to answer these questions once and for all. Duel Monsters is over. Welcome to the Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Zane and Cyrus Truesdale, the child prodigy and the, well, the child. I'd love to have a boisterous title ready for Cyrus, but all I can think about is the character's stereotypical anxious and apprehensive voice from the English version of the anime. That's no disrespect towards Wayne Grayson, but good god, that voice acting is grating on my ears. You traded my bed for a card! Nonetheless, these characters were both introduced in very important and dynamic roles to our main protagonist, Jade and Yuki. Zane being the top ranked duelist in Duel Academy and a fitting successor to Seto Kaiba, until he listened to Hawthorne Heights for the first time. I can't make it on my own. And Cyrus being the lovable sidekick, if you love fashioning your Raycon earbuds with thumbtacks. <laughs> I'm sorry, I just can't get over that voice in the dub. But let's put my personal qualms aside and get into the anime-exclusive cards. Several of their cards were seen in the duel between the two brothers in episode 95, so maybe we'll see the power difference between these two duelists. Starting with Zane, who surprisingly has no exclusives that are specifically tied to Cyber Dragons or Cyber Darks. Card from a different dimension is a normal spell card and if this card is banished, add it to your hand during your next standby phase. If this card is returned to the hand this way, both players draw two cards. The effect isn't awful, but I'm also struggling to find much good in it. GX has far too many cards, which we'll cover in this season, that only have effects when not activated, meaning you can't play them as a standard card. In this instance, you're reliant on discarding it from your hand, milling it, or having it destroyed while set so you can banish it from your graveyard, or banishing it directly from any of those locations, which in most scenarios will be from your own card effects, so it's not even a plus one. It's hand neutral at best on your end, but also gives your opponent two free cards for simply existing. I might have given a slight pass to this card as a cheeky consistency boost to any banish focused deck if only you drew the cards, but in the modern landscape, giving your opponent two opportunities to pick up the out to your deck is less than an applicable strategy to say the least. You could say that something in the realm of good card design was lost, much like the next card. Lost Pride, which was also played by Cyrus, a normal trap card that requires you to discard one spell card as an activation cost. Then you can add one spell card from your opponent's graveyard to your hand. If you activate that card, you take 1000 damage. Obviously, Zane lost any pride in playing a better card. There's an ancient card that we've had in the physical game since 2002 that does exactly what this card does, but better. And that is Grave Robber, a Joey classic. No discarding of your valuable spell card, although that's probably how Zane got the first card in the graveyard now, isn't it? But this is the real world we're talking about, and Grave Robber only comes with a measly 2,000 damage as cost for using your opponent's spell card. Hell, people pay twice that amount for the Solemn cards. Why are you playing bad cards, my child? Next is Power Load, and for Zane's sake, it better be powerful. It's an equipped spell card that can only be equipped to a machine-type monster. It gains attack equal to the number of times every other machine-type monster you control can attack, times 400. All monsters you control cannot attack, except the equipped monster. You got lucky this time. As much as I hate one-turn kill strategies, this sounds like a lot of fun, and in my mind is the pinnacle of a respectable OTK. One massive attack that hopefully closes out the game. No gimmicks, no lockouts, just pure, unadulterated ATK. The number crunching in relation to attacking effects is interesting as well. In its simplest form, if you control 5 vanilla machine monsters, the equipped monster gains 1600 attack. Your Axe of Despair has nothing on my load. Pause. But does this card's effect account for monsters who have their own effect to attack twice? For example, if you control two attack position Morphtronic Boomboxen, does the equipped monster gain 800 attack for each, or is it still 400? 
Does a monster affected by double attack grant a double attack boost? Or does power load ignore that effect? And on the reverse of that, if a monster is unable to attack, whether that be a condition from a continuous card or by its own effect, is it not counted towards the total attack increase? There's a lot of variable to this card, but that only entices me more in wanting to try some form of caveman machine OTK deck should we ever see this card printed. However, if you're not in the market for a machine deck but still crave the variables of inconsistent card effects, have I ever got the solution for you? Warp Beam is a normal spell card and upon activation you target any number of face-up monsters you control. Then send an equal number of cards you control to the graveyard except the targeted monsters. This turn, the attack of each selected monster becomes 600, and those monsters can attack your opponent directly. I'll be honest, I would have pegged this for a Cyrus card. A semi-feasible way to get around your opponent's problematic and probably massive monsters without actually dealing with them. It's right up his alley. For maximum direct damage output, you would need to control 4 monsters and 4 cards in the back row when activating this card, to which you are then clearing your back row for 2400 points of damage, varying on whether or not you have any additional cards to pump those numbers up. Going back to our machine deck, one limiter removal doubles that output and I can get behind that. This is not a great quality of the card though, unless you're Zane and need to put a specific set card in your graveyard for later use. How convenient. Make no mistake, I still like the card, but its usefulness is extremely slim. That 2400 better be enough to end the duel. Or, Zane could skip the shenanigans entirely and just use Power Bond, one of his most recognized cards just behind the Cyber Dragons. But unfortunately, Plan B is in short supply, so we need to execute Plan T. Specifically, Time Fusion, a normal spell card that requires you to banish one card in your hand. All right, I'm really starting to eat my words on card from a different dimension. Target one fusion monster in your graveyard that was destroyed this turn while on your side of the field. Then special summon it during your next standby phase, ignoring the summoning conditions. That monster cannot declare an attack during the turn it is summoned. Is it a bad effect? Absolutely not. Could it have been made better if it were of the quick play variety? 1,000 times over. As it is, you're recovering a monster that was destroyed by your opponent's card effect or that you kamikazied into one of your opponent's stronger monsters to proc a floating effect. You do have several options to make this card live, but adding the spell speed 2 dynamic would level this card with the majority of recovery spells for the GX era, and solidified time fusion as a staple card even going into future formats of the game. Because the recovery occurs during the standby phase after the turn it was activated, it functions closely to setting and activating something like Call of the Haunted. You don't really want your spell cards to act like trap cards. Actually, you'd rather them be a trap card with Zane's final card. Trap Booster, which was also played by Franz and Prince Ogin in GX, it's a quick play spell card and at the cost of a single discard, during this turn, you can activate one trap card from your hand. The Makura Errata before the Makura Errata. It's not going to win you games or anything, but my favorite aspect of this card's effect is the mind games you can play with your opponent. Nothing here says that I have to activate a trap card from my hand, but playing this card would imply that I do have a trap card that I can activate to potentially interrupt your play or ruin your day. Bars. Like I said, you're not going to win on the back of Trap Booster unless maybe you alternate between bluffing a trap card than actually using one. You know, maybe my therapist was right. I am the toxic one. Oh well, time to move on to Cyrus. If you caught the teaser trailer for Season 2, you may remember his first card. I summon Kiteroid! Kiteroid, a level 1 wind machine effect monster with 200 attack and 400 defense, carrying two Karibo-esque effects. You can discard this card to reduce the battle damage you take from a direct attack to zero. While this card is in the graveyard, you can reduce the battle damage you take from a direct attack to zero, and you can only use the second effect of Kiteroid once per duel. Does it have anything to do with Cyrus's Roid archetype? Well, about as much as any of the other Roid monsters have relation to one another, that's to say they don't relate at all. Funny enough, being a level 1 monster and with its effects, it actually feels right at home in a Karibo deck. It's not the greatest addition, but can definitely aid in your hairy balls not allowing your opponent to take you down. Let's be real, Cyrus in his pipsqueak piracy of the Cars movie needed all the protection it could muster. Help me! As evident with the next card. 
Cyber Repairer, a normal trap card that when activated allows your opponent to draw one card. During this turn, machine type monsters you control cannot be destroyed by battle. I don't hate it, but just like the cards that have effects that activate anywhere but on the field, GX also had a sick obsession with giving your opponent more advantage than yourself. I beat the dead horse of Waboku more than enough in Duel Monsters, so now I have to introduce other alternatives for nonsense like this. Negate Attack, Threatening Roar, or if you're ready to play with the big boys, any variant of Mirror Force would be an acceptable option over Cyber Repairer. It's a simple metric of balance. You can either give your opponent a free card and still take all of the damage, or you can not do any of those things while still protecting your monsters. It's your call. Cyrus just needs to put the phone down. Unfortunately, I am not sponsored by NordVPN yet, so I don't have a clever transition to the next card, but it's Dark Computer Virus. Yeah, I'd imagine there's a virus in the unidentified viscous fluid on your laptop, you disgusting gremlin. Uh, uh. It's a normal trap card needing the tribute of one dark machine type monster and allows you to change the target of one continuous spell card to another appropriate target. Oh, I had to do some deep dives for this card because at face value I couldn't think of a single situation in which you would activate this card in response to a continuous spell. For the majority of continuous spells, any targeting that you are doing as the controller is targeting your own cards, be that granting immunity for a turn, recovering from the graveyard, etc. There's absolutely no reason you would need to change the original target that you chose unless you're brain dead. However, further sleuthing revealed a few continuous spells that your opponent might use to target your cards in which you may want to change their designated target. Those being Gradle Impact, Rainbow Bridge of the Heart, the Kaiju Files, and Evo Price, among others. And with these effects, your opponent targets your cards to be removed from the field in one way or another. 12 times out of 5, your opponent is attempting to remove a problematic card on your field, to which you can then change to one of your lesser cards. Discounting the metal gymnastics we just went through to find where this card is even usable, it's still trash. At minimum, you need to be controlling three cards for this effect to be live. One to be your opponent's original target, one dark machine to tribute, then another appropriate target that your opponent's card effect can be transferred to, which in most cases needs to be a third monster. Seeing that nearly all targeting effects from continuous spell cards are single destruction, you've elected to go minus three instead. I know that desperate times call for desperate measures, but I'd rather scoop. We are halfway through Cyrus's cards, and so far, he hasn't produced anything too remarkable. I can't say I'm surprised. Moving on to Life Force, a continuous trap card, and if you would take battle damage while this card is face up, you can pay 400 life points instead. Oh, if this were a normal trap card, as in a one-time use, I'd be ripping this card apart with my usual comparisons to better battle traps. The non-once per turn and repetitive use is cute, but I'm still not a fan of this one. I also have a personal beef with this card because when Cyrus used this card in the anime, he activated the effect when attacked by Zane's Cyber Dark Keel, which at the time had 400 attack points. For what reason? I know it would have been the same result either way, so it shouldn't bother me as much as it does, but why did he feel the need to do that? Like every card in this game, it has a place. Here is this card's place. Mirror Damage is a normal trap card that can be equipped to a monster you control when activated. If you would take battle damage equal to the equipped monster's original attack by the effect of a spell card, your opponent takes that damage instead. When this card is removed from the field, destroy the equipped monster. That's a lot of faith you're putting into a monster that can now be destroyed by Mystical Space Typhoon. I... I just... I need to demonstrate precisely how asinine and improbable this effect is. Going back to the Yu-Gi-Oh that our forefathers played, if your opponent would activate Ukazi, you can reverse that damage by equipping mirror damage to your dark gray. Or maybe the opponent brought out the big guns with Meteor of Destruction. We can counter that by equipping mirror to our molten behemoth, fighting fire with fire. If I'm pitted against Brooklyn's finest, his Hinotama magic card is useless against my mighty guard. But oh baby, his giant true nade really puts a wrench in the works. <coughs> and lastly, if your opponent wields the power of the legendary Sparks, they will fall victim to the Dragon Piper. <coughs> Needless to say, you won't be stopping anything with this. 
As of recently, my different dimension deck has been feeling a bit stale. They haven't received any good support in far too long, so the next card tickles my peach. Remove Bomb, a normal spell card that banishes the top 5 cards of your deck, then inflicts 300 damage to your opponent for each monster card banished this way. You see, the problem with modern banish for cost effects is that everything gets banished face down. Grin Maju make cream at the site of Banish 10, but my DD cards can't do a damn thing with that. This, on the other hand, is perfect. Best case scenario, granted I'm looking at a GX format, I've got 5 monsters to pull back with return and 1500 burn damage to boot. Worst case scenario, looking at my most recent build, I now have an excuse to pull out my playsets of Flower Dino and Magistric Magician to make use of the banished back row, giving them a new life in my different dimension deck. Much like Ring of Life, a normal trap card that is basically a direct counterpart to Ring of Destruction. Destroy one face-up monster, gain life points equal to that monster's defense. Then, if the monster destroyed was on your opponent's side of the field, they also gain life points equal to that monster's defense. Let the record show that calling this a direct counterpart to Ring of Destruction doesn't automatically make it good. In fact, that description probably should have keyed you in that this card would be atrocious. Whenever we've looked at life point gaining cards in this series, Arrow Mage inevitably comes up. That's not because Arrow Mage would make the best use of it, although I'm like 98% sure that is the case, but because I don't know any other life point gaining decks. Can anyone tell me where else this card might be played? I'm thinking maybe Nurse Burn or something? Clearly, I need to get trained up on Yu-Gi-Oh! archetypes so I can better determine where these oddball cards could potentially find success. Luckily, Cyrus has me covered with his field spell card, Training Field, which I think could be a contender for the most bizarre card effect of GX. While this card is on the field, players can target their own monsters for attacks. Why? If they do, the attacking monster gains 300 attack and the battling monsters are not destroyed by battle. Somehow, it never fails that an unusual effect is absolutely useless. Why are we magical arm shielding ourselves? I'm going to suspend disbelief and say that the 300 attack point increase is permanent. But if that's what we're aiming for, there are LOB equip spells that do the same thing without committing friendly fire. The monsters aren't destroyed, so you can't proc any of your own floating effects. The only thing you accomplish is damaging yourself. I don't know guys, everyone says that Zane is the emo one with his whole black parade aesthetic, but Zane definitely strikes me as a pain for pleasure kind of guy, the sub of all subs. <laughs> with cards like this, I'm genuinely concerned for Cyrus's mental state. Somebody get my man some help. He needs to be more like Psychroid, the most lovable and friendly of all of the Veacroids. It can arm itself with training wheels, which is great because they turn that riveting bit of lore into an actual card in the anime. Training Wheels, to be precise, an equip spell card that can only be equipped to, you guessed it, Psychroid. It can attack your opponent directly. If the equipped monster inflicts battle damage to your opponent by a direct attack, banish this card and the equipped monster until your next standby phase. I like it, full stop. That one turn phase out while leaving you a bit vulnerable during your opponent's next turn at least secures you a monster on the field going into your next turn, which is always appreciated. What I would personally like to see in a physical print is this card be able to equip to any roid monster within the archetype. Yes, it's not 100% lore accurate at that point, but there are also far better targets to use with this than a psychroid. And that was our final card for this week. You know what that means. It's time for the patent pending purple pineapple grading scale. I'll take the total number of cards covered in this episode and get a percentage based on the number of cards that I feel are most deserving of a physical print. Anything 70% or above is a passing grade. Of the mere 14 cards we've covered this week, Cyrus and Zane get a 57%, with eight out of their collective 14 cards being at least serviceable for modern use. Feeling a bit of deja vu from the previous episode, but I promise it wasn't on purpose. And to my surprise, Zane wasn't doing much heavy lifting. They were pretty well dispersed for whose cards should come to the physical game. But that's going to wrap up this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. Let me know your thoughts. What is your favorite card from this week's discussion? And which of Cyrus and Zane's anime exclusive cards do you want to see come to the physical game? Drop a comment down below. If you like the video, don't forget to drop a big thumbs up. 
It's greatly appreciated, as always, guys. And until next time, this has been Purple Pineapple TV. Signing off. Hey guys, thanks for checking out this week's episode of The Secrets of Yu-Gi-Oh! GX. If you're new to the channel here, go ahead and hit that subscribe button for me down below with bell notifications on so you never miss a single episode of this series. If you missed last week's episode, you can check that out in the bottom right corner. Or if you want to check out Season 1 where we covered every anime exclusive card from the Duel Monsters era, you can check out the playlist right up here. Thanks again for watching guys, and we'll see you in the next one.